Hello everyone, uh, I welcome you to this panel, Philosophy of Nature, and I hope that we will provide you with some good information and fun as well today. So if you'll excuse me, I will sit to this and start right about now. So my presentation is on Imani Shiskinji's notions of time and history. Imani Shikinji is well, is well known as the father of Shizengaku, an interdisciplinary attempt to grasp the natural world in its wholeness. His strive for a definition of Shizengaku flowered in his major work, Seibutsu no Sekai, A World of Living Things, which was written originally in 1941, where Imanishi presents Shizengaku as a theological anthropomorphic interpretation of the living world. His theory strongly opposes Darwin's theory of natural selection and mechanistic interpretation of natural world. Also, his efforts are directed towards reconsidering concrete living things unseparated from their environment. For Imanishi, the natural world is not chaotic or random, despite the fact that it's ceaselessly changing. When we immerse in reading, say, Butsu no Sekai, we immediately notice Nishida's thought echoing throughout the whole text. First of all, Imanishi defines the world of living things as a holistic system based on an undivided continuity of non-dualism in which every organism and species originated from one thing. The perspective that everything in this world developed and differentiated from one thing is fundamental to Imanishi's views on the relatedness of all things, either living or non-living in the world. In Zen no Kenkyu, for instance, Nishida argued that reality is an unified whole. I quote, in such mutual opposition, the two entities are not totally independent realities, for they must be unified. They must be a part of the development of one reality through differentiation, end of quote. In addition, backed up by Nishida, again, Imanishi describes the species as a community of so or society of organisms, a social phenomenon which is characterized as teleologically oriented towards self-completeness in wholeness. Species, then, is, I quote, a territorial extension of individuals belonging to a kinship community which, by virtue of having the same morphology, have the same way of living, and in turn, through following the same lifestyle, have similar bodies. If we take this step further, we can say that because they subsist in the same way, they have the same direction of living and accordingly will tend to express the same variation." End of quote. In other words, a body is a manifestation of environment and environment is transformed by body of living things. Moreover, for Imanishi, species is an existent entity with an autonomous nature whose various individuals are continually contributing to the maintenance and perpetuation of the specia to which they belong. Imanishi argues that if everything in this world stemmed and developed from one single thing, sociality must be structural principle of such a world. And as this world is spatiotemporal, specia have a structure. That means that individuals make social bonds via their bodies, and also they have function. That means that individuals of species evolve to perpetuate the species. <coughs> so to sum up this first part, individuality for him is ephemeral, although on the other hand, society is everlasting, and no individual can exist outside the social context. As we can see, Species is the key concept to analyze Imanishi's understanding of life in spatiotemporal world of nature. As Imanishi contends, species is fated, quote unquote, to evolve. Evolution per se is discussed in the chapter on history with a considerable uh, emphasis on the sociality of living things. Here Imanishi contends that evolution is constantly both opposing, uh, both opposed, I'm sorry, and supported uh, by temporal structure of the world. On one hand, in terms of individual organism, the temporal structure limits life, life of individual, and in terms of species, time limits and indefinite continuation of species. 
Once a species approaches closer to the summit of development, it begins to self-destruct and another one, another one replaces it. However, on the other hand, it is for the temporal structure of nature that all, on all levels of living, be it individual organism or species, the growth and development is possible. Precisely at this point, Imanishi turns his discussion from an indefinite time as an objective condition imposed on living things towards history, meaning history of evolution. In the sense, history of natural world is history of rise and fall of leading species, that is, the ruling class. It is understandable why Imanishi, focusing on species as a representation of natural continuum, takes this step. On an individual level, living thing in spatiotemporal world is a bodily existence continuously in the state of gradual decay, which eventually results in death. However, as I mentioned before from the perspective of history of evolution, individual body as a structure and life as a function comes to play as fundamental factor in the perpetuation of species. Every single individual as a manifestation of species has body, structure and life, function. Whenever we find structure, it never occurs alone. It is always accompanied by action. Therefore, a growth and development of living things must be growth and development of both structure and function. Thus, living things tend to maintain their structural and functional existence and thus maintain the species. To do so, what is created in turn becomes creator and adds to this world what is similar to itself. The cells reproduce cells to maintain individuals, and the individuals recreate themselves and thus maintain the species. To conclude this part, if development of structure and function of living things, either as a single organism or as a species, is wholeness oriented, as the Manishi condensed from the very beginning, evolution must be an inherent directedness, not a result of chance accumulation. It is precisely the directness that we look back on and call it the history of a living world. Nevertheless, one must be careful not to mistake evolution of one species with one species linear development. But Imanishi species evolutionary ranked as a ruling class is not directed only towards growth, development and prosperity, but also towards self-destruction, which is, so to speak, a mechanism of maintaining equilibrium in the whole. For example, the Mesozoic era is called the age of reptiles because reptiles <laughs> dominated the world and occupied the ruling class of that age. Reptiles created a new world while the fish and insects did not participate actively in the historical development of this period. And yet, the ruling class of reptiles ultimately collapsed. Imanishi considers that the destruction was inherent in the self-integration of the whole community, of the sinusial complex, doishakai. He characterizes the sinusial complexes as a cooper or cooperative space species characterized by their mutual habitat segregation, which makes them a kind of hierarchical society. It is limited and conservative society that cannot compete randomly with and replace other species, other classes. It maintains its own position in the social organization, thereby maintaining the equilibrium of the society of living things. So we can easily imagine the world of living things as having the individual and the world at opposite extremes. Each individual is at the center of his own world and is connected to the whole world through the species society. Sinusia, sinusial complexes, and the whole communities. Of course, each of these societies can be thought as a center of the world. Each of them has self-completeness, which means that this kind of whole community will not <coughs> continue indefinitely. One whole community starts with its own features and develops by utilizing them until the extreme. Once it reaches the summit of its development, sooner or later it begins to self-destruct and by its collapse, another whole community with different features begins to develop. On self-completeness of Sinusia, Imanishi has an intriguing point which makes the temporal perspective even more complex. Imanishi finds a species society as systematically incomplete and undeveloped, but with the potential to develop indefinitely.
On one hand, the evolution of species as ruling class is temporarily limited by its development summit. On the other hand, the evolution never ceases to progress, even though a species loses its rank as a ruling class. When the reptile species, for instance, once they were replaced by mammals as a ruling class, gradually became smaller and adapted to different environments. We definitely cannot claim that there is a certain exact starting point in time when this all happened, but paleontology is able to prove that the rise of species is always accompanied by a fall of different ones. For Imanishi, it is a proof that a strive for self-completeness and equilibrium is inherent to the whole society of species. So far, we were talking about evolution, development, self-completeness and directedness as characteristics of species and sinusoidal complexes in the world of living things. Therefore, any kind of stasis is impossible in such a world. Imanishi calls it the very foundation of life in living things. I quote, in general, in the spatial and temporal world, absolute stasis is not possible in anything. The very foundation of life lies in the impossibility of stasis." End of quote. In other words, living means acting, and those which are created will create those which in their turn will create again. However, here we are not talking about simple reproduction. There is also a creativity inherent to every living thing. Manishi gives us a vivid example of such a moment of creativity and evolution of Kenozoic era. Back then, after Mesozoic era of reptiles, mammals and birds became the most distinctive representatives of animal kingdom. After the fall of reptiles, the whole community regained its equilibrium and completeness, and the Kenozoic era became the age of mammals, gaining the highest place in social structure. I quote, Mammals, for instance, adapted to occupy the empty life fields, the empty places, so to speak, left by now extinct reptiles. Eventually, almost without exception, these places were filled by various species of mammals. Herbivores and their predators emerged, marine marsh and tree dwellers, even flying mammals such as bats. End of quote. However, in the Kenozoic era, the reptiles were not simply replaced or alternated by mammals waiting somewhere in the shadow of the world for their chance. Also, although it's a fact that some reptiles gradually metamorphosed into mammals, it's not that reptiles simply evolved into mammals. But when you see such, such, fact, such facts prove the extent of inherent creativity of living things, also, although it is a fact that some reptiles gradually metamorphosed into mammals, it's not that reptiles simply evolved uh, into mammals. Very many such, such facts prove the extent of inherent creativity of living things. And considering that next ruling class always comes from the ruling class destined to collapse, inherent continuity of leading species in the history of evolution seems undeniable. It should also be mentioned here that reptiles, a ruling class of the previous period, had now to change, change to adapt creatively to the new era. And precisely for such ability to adapt, to be creative in the world, which was more and more hostile to them, they survived until these days. The principle of adaptation is based on a dialectic between the environment and the species, beginning on the level of individual. There is no random variation, which is a mere abstract product of considering living things apart from their way of living. I quote, living organisms follow a certain course of living. That course is neither determined by the organisms nor by the environment. It is the directedness of creativity determined by the freedom of necessity, end of quote. Now, I would like to present several conclusive marks Evolution is both reproduction and creation, and creativity are attributes of living organisms. To live then is to act and create. Every single action in daily life has undeniable importance in evolution. The history of the living world and of the evolution of living things might, may be defined as a history of rise and fall of the ruling class. Moreover, this ruling class is contained in a class society and is born from the ruling class. 
For instance, mankind arose within the community of mammals and has replaced other mammals temporarily as the ruling class in the society of living things. In spatiotemporal world as a condition of life, historic determination of living things as ruling class is delimited by rise and fall. Evolution evinces continuity, regeneration, and creativity applied on every level of living entity, either as individual or species or synusial complexes. Basically, all these complexities ultimate, ultimately emerge from an interaction between structure and function of every single organism and the environment which it occupies. At every level of life, absolute stasis is impossible. In terms of evolution, development is enforced by the impossibility of stasis. Although in the history of evolution we perceive different species occupying the position of ruling class, there is a traceable continuity and directedness that Imanishi views as necessity emerging from the world as a sinusial complex of specia, where everything originated and differentiated from one thing. Imanishi Shisengaku presents the world of living things <coughs> as being characterized by continuity, self-completeness, organization, and hierarchy. Now I cannot help but wonder about the place of randomness and unpredictability in such a world. And that is a question I will address to Imanishi in my next research. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Or for questions, so if anyone has any question or remark to do that, Carlos? Uh, well, this is very interesting ruling class. Does he, does Imanishi use, when, when he says ruling class, does he use the same expression for ruling class in Japanese? I mean, um, yes, it is the same expression. And now, right now, I cannot, I cannot uh, recall. Uh, it's Shihai. Um, yes, exactly, Shihai Kaikyu. Thank you very much, Yusan. Yes, it's the same expression. Yes. So, so, I wonder to what extent he, he wants to make a parallel between uh, social structure and the relationship between species, among species in the natural world. Apparently, he does. Yes. He compares the, in a sense, he, he compares uh, the world of species to, um, to uh, society. He sees it as a social phenomenon on every level of existence of living thing. So yes, the para it, it's very anthropomorphic uh, interpretation of nature, what he does in here. Okay, so I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is the, uh, for no social species, there are sociality as well, because you have shown the structure and function, sociality and evolution, mm -hmm. and expression of speciality and expression, expression of temporality. But for some species, I would say, in general, like as for Barnes-Cotton, we Use, we use the word the term sociality or social only for like um, species that lives in community in communal way like ants and bees and like let's say monkeys and human beings. But for uh, humanity, for all species, there is a yeah. He applies it to all species. I see. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, my second question is, in the last quotation mm -hmm. of Imanishi, mm -hmm. uh, there was the word Kitsuyo no Jiyui. Kitsuyo no Jiyui no. Kitsuyo no Jiyui no. It's quite um, um, interesting because Kitsuyo the necessity or obligation mm -hmm. and the uh, freedom, they are um, the words um, in, used in a positive way. So, what's the understanding of freedom in, in 
Well, I believe that what, what he means uh, when he speaks of freedom is uh, precisely the necessity, the uh, impossibility of choice. That there is only one choice to follow. But I, I am not really, really sure if that is what he means, but I cannot, um, I cannot imagine any, any other possible interpretation of this, because as I was, uh, as I was reading Seibutsu no Sekai, it, uh, it seemed to me all the more uh, that as everything is directed towards uh, one goal, to maintain the species, to perpetuate the species, even on the individual level or as, uh, as this uh, so social complex uh, of, of a species. Um, it is just one direction and one necessity. And this necessity uh, stems from precisely the freedom of only one choice to follow this path and not the other because the species or the individual cannot choose not to follow and de deviate from from the from the species like uh, if i if i oversimplify this we might say that the fish cannot act as a bee yes or something like this i think that that is what he means when he talks about this but i would also glad to be glad to discuss this further as well because sometimes he's very unclear in what he means when he's talking about this. It's, it's, it's also the case of when he speaks about uh, species being fated to evolve. Like what is fate in nature? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have one more yes. And then Philip. Very shortly. <coughs> Do you know or do you think uh, there is some gather in his writings? Uh, once again, please. Uh, do you think, do you know or do you think there is some gather in his writings? Like if he has been influenced by gather. Ah, Gether. yes. Um, well. Well, I, I perceive him to be very anti-Darwinist. Anti in a sense, and for instance, uh, he denies the natural selection, and um, well, I'm not that that well versed in in this uh, in this topic, but yeah, I think I think that I can I can agree. But I would like to I would like to compare the shifts between those two, to be. Uh, to be very clear about this. Mm. Yeah, I need some more. I think I need some more research. Because, because I mean, Githa was extremely widely read mm. in, the, in, the, in Japan, or even Nishida, and in the sort of um, philosophical milieu, it was a very strong, like, there was a strong reception of it. Also, you know, in Tazarvist. So when he's talking about metamorphosis, or where he had a strong, uh, union form and function. Well, especially in this, especially in this last topic, could be could come from the, the metamorphosis of plant, for instance. Mm. And it's uh, it, it, will, it could be worth exploring as a connection. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And I think Philip has a question. Is that right? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like two questions. Um, one is, do you think it would be better to speak of natural history in this case? Because when you speak of history, I think mainly of something which is uniquely human and where human action determines events irreversibly. And also if Imanishi uh, talks of history in this other sense, I'm interested. Um, and then also <coughs> point three that you had, uh, where he says everything uh, is originated from one thing. What is this one thing? Yes, this... <laughs> well, uh, first of uh, at first I will, uh, I will answer the, the first questions. Natural history, yes, uh, I think that's a good idea. He speaks of history as a history of evolution. 
in, in this sense. And then he conceives this history of evolution as a history of natural world. So it, it might, might be identifiable, these two, these two terms. Um, but also there is this emphasis on the rise and fall of ruling class as the, as the history of evolution. So it's a bit reducive, I would say, uh, compared to the term natural history. And for the, for the second question, well, that one thing. Uh, in the <coughs> introduction of Sebotsu no Sekai, he says that it was, uh, uh, I paraphrase, uh, it was only once in the history of the world uh, that uh, something originated from nothing, that the world emerged ex nihilo. And then he completely stops talking about this. Yes, so one thing was probably nothing <laughs> in this sense. And from this nothing, everything emerged. I will, I will uh, leave it to your imagination <laughs> what that exactly could mean. <laughs> Okay. Is that okay? okay. Okay. So I think if anyone uh, has another question, we can uh, talk more during lunchtime because of the time constraints. So thank you, Christina, for your your interesting presentation, and thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much.